Cornelius Vanderbilt, a titan of industry, rose from modest beginnings to become America's wealthiest man in the 19th century. Known as the Commodore, Vanderbilt began his journey in the bustling ports of New York, initially toiling in his father's ferry business. With a blend of ruthless ambition and savvy business acumen, he swiftly expanded his empire, venturing into steamboats and then dominating the emerging railroad industry. His ventures not only amassed immense wealth, but also reshaped the American transportation landscape, building the very railway infrastructure which would lead to the nation's march towards industrialization. Vanderbilt's legacy, however, extended beyond railroads and steamships. His passing in 1877 marked the beginning of a new era for the Vanderbilt dynasty. His vast fortune, primarily inherited by his son William, sparked an era of opulence and extravagance that became synonymous with the Gilded Age. While Cornelius had grown up in squalor and had become the richest man in America, he still chose to live modestly while he was alive. The Vanderbilt descendants, however, embraced a penchant for grandeur and embarked on constructing some of the most magnificent and lavish mansions in the United States. These architectural marvels, scattered across the country, reflected not just their immense wealth, but also their desire to etch the Vanderbilt name into the records of American history and high society. Following the death of his father, William constructed a mansion at 645th Avenue in Manhattan that would become known as the Triple Palace. He hired architects Charles B. Atwood and John B. Snook to carry out his complicated vision for his dream house. William had an extensive art collection and needed space to display it. He also wanted a private space for his daughters Emily and Margaret to live with their own families. The house was designed to have a single family unit in the southern wing and a duplex on the northern wing. This design allowed William to remain close to his family while allowing his daughters to live their own lives in private. In the press, the house would be referred to as the Vanderbilt Twins because it was really two separate mansions that had been married by their design while housing three branches of the same family. The two wings of the mansion were connected by a portico and separated by a large courtyard and tied together by a unified brownstone facade. Originally, the mansion had been planned to boast a limestone facade, but William wanted something more practical and familiar, so he changed the plans to suit his preferences at the last moment of the design process. Snook and Atwood sought out classical elements to inspire the design of the house. It boasted Doric and Corinthian-style columns along its facade, and was graced by horizontal string courses to delineate the stories of the house, and ornate entablatures depicted vines wrapping around in three dimensions. Many of the windows were adorned with vases overflowing with flowers. Looking up further along the facade, the cornice would have demanded attention to the lion's head set boldly beneath the parapet wall surrounded by a balustrade, a detail which served to cap off the house in lieu of a pitched roof. On the first floor, both mansions were connected by doors that would be open to accommodate large parties as the families would jointly entertain guests. Unlike many of the other homes, this house was completely surrounded by lawns and separated from the sidewalk by balustrade, with ornate bronze lanterns affixed to them at intervals. The pavement stones leading into the portico were laid on a massive scale. The largest stone to be quarried to this time in American history weighed over 44,000 pounds with dimensions of about 25 feet by 15 feet and was laid out in front of the portico. Approaching the southern wing of the mansion before going inside would have left any guest in awe and anticipation of what other marbles might be found behind the front door. You would have entered the southern wing through a vestibule that was paved in mosaic marble tiles that extended from the floor to decorate the walls and ceiling surrounding a skylight overhead. The main door, crafted from bronze, connected the vestibule to the house's interior and cost William a whopping $25,000, or the modern-day equivalent of about half a million dollars. Opening these doors would lead you to the main hallway, clad with marble floors and graced with wood paneling and a solid marble fireplace complemented by feminine bronze reliefs. Branching off from the hallway was a three-story art gallery that had its own entrance from 51st Street. Off of the gallery were a couple of other rooms including a conservatory. Traveling along the main hallway would have taken you to a large dining room with elliptical arched ceilings inlaid with wood paneling. Continuing through the main hall, you would have encountered various other rooms, including the drawing room, parlor, and the library. The drawing room contained red velvet walls and sculptural butterflies made from mother of pearl which would have glowed in the flickering light. The library carried on this iridescent glow by incorporating mother of pearl into the furniture. The parlor was themed separately to be based on Japanese design with faux bamboo ceilings and lacquered cabinets. The grand staircase was crafted by artisans from oak and wrapped around a light well spanning 60 feet in length. Decorating the walls around the stairs were nine stained glass windows with scenes to depict the success of the Vanderbilt family and their wealth. Exploring the second floor, each bedroom would have been completely unique, with their own themes and finishes done to the taste of each individual family member. The duplex to the north was just as grand in its own right, with mirrored galleries, grand parlors, a billiards room, ornate dining rooms, and reception rooms for each daughter. On the third floor were guest rooms which surrounded the light well. Each of them shared dressing rooms and had private staircases leading to the rooftop terrace. The creation of this house involved 600 workers to construct the building, 
not including the 60 European sculptures brought in to decorate the house inside and out. By the time the house was finished, it cost $2 million to complete, or the modern-day equivalent of over $50 million, the majority of which was spent decorating the rooms. In 1883, the art gallery was extended, and William invited 1,000 guests to attend a ball. A couple of weeks later, he celebrated the grand opening of his new art gallery and invited 3,000 additional guests. William then opened his gallery to the public to allow anyone to come in and be inspired by the paintings he so loved. Unfortunately, the general public did not behave in the manner in which William expected them to while visiting his home, so he closed the gallery to the public and reopened it strictly by invitation only. In 1885, William unexpectedly passed away, leaving the house to his daughter Maria who was to leave the house to William's youngest son George upon her passing. The will stipulated that the house and art collection should remain in the family to be passed down from son to son. In 1896, Maria died and left the house to George, but George was already building the Biltmore Mansion in North Carolina and had no interest in living in his father's home, which he considered to be outdated and passe. George purchased 195 square miles of land near Asheville, North Carolina, and hired prominent landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted to not only plan the viewshed and formal gardens, but to make the estate self-sustaining by including dozens of farms. While Olmsted was hard at work creating the perfect landscape, George hired famous Gilded Age architect Richard Morris Hunt to design a mansion the likes of which the country had never seen before. When it was all said and done, the mansion, which would be named the Biltmore, would boast over 178,000 square feet with 250 rooms, 35 bedrooms, and 43 bathrooms. Just to give you an idea of the sheer size, if you were to lay out the rooms on one level, they would cover more than four acres of floor space. The four-story mega-mansion was planned to be nestled in the hills, becoming part of the ridgeline. Construction started in 1889 and stretched on for six years with over 1,000 workers laboring every day on site. The brick walls were reinforced with steel frames and the facade was clad in Indiana limestone, which was brought to the property by way of a private railroad. Entering the home through the vestibule, we arrive in the main hall, clad in limestone and set at larger-than-life proportions. To the side, natural light penetrates the deep interiors through the winter garden's glass pane ceiling. And just beyond the space, we will find the largest room in the house, the banquet hall. From end to end, it measures 72 feet long with barrel vaulted ceilings soaring 70 feet overhead. When the table is assembled with its many leaves, it can comfortably accommodate 64 dinner guests in front of the triple fireplace finished out with intricate figurative relief work. On the opposite wall, a built-in pipe organ was meant to bellow, echoing live music through the mansion's cavernous halls. Though this is not where the Vanderbilts would have dined when they were not entertaining. Instead, they would have sat in the breakfast room towards the rear of the house, a more intimate space when compared to the banquet hall. While we are here, we can take a peek behind the scenes to find the kitchen and the pantry. Of course, a family living a life of unfathomable luxury would not have prepared their own meals. Their live-in staff would have catered to their every need. Cutting across the rear of the house, we will pass from the breakfast room into the salon, decorated with antique European furnishings which George had collected while the Biltmore was being constructed. This will lead us into the music room, clad in halfite oak paneling below hand-stenciled beams running along the ceiling. From here we will dodge the main hall and explore the other wing of the house, making our way into the gallery, which stretches 90 feet from end to end with a collection of centuries-old Flemish tapestries. The gallery terminates on the library, housing over 10,000 volumes on its shelves. It is clad in walnut panels and designed in the Baroque style, even featuring a ceiling mural which had been stripped from a building in Italy and reinstalled intact, a true marvel of not only art, but logistics for accomplishing such a feat. Though we have already covered a space larger than the White House, we still have not seen the entire first floor. The billiards room, clad in oak paneling below a dazzling array of artisan plasterwork on the ceiling, offered a retreat for George Vanderbilt's male friends through the hidden passage on the back wall. This leads to the smoking room, and eventually to the bachelor wing where single gentleman guests would have been sequestered away from the ladies of the house. Now we can begin making our way up the grand, cantilevered staircase, rotating around a double-hung chandelier, which has been suspended from an ornate, rib-vaulted medallion on the ceiling. The iron balustrade seamlessly curves with the steps and is capped off by a wood handrail, adding just the right amount of warmth to the stone atrium. Up here we will find the bedrooms of both George and his wife, Edith. First we will explore George's room, finished out with a painted cornice above a dentilated plate rail. All of the furnishings are upholstered in a striking red and paired with antique wooden furniture. This opens into the oak sitting room, which adjoins to Edith's room on the other end, providing a private retreat for the couple. Edith's bedroom is the grandest bedroom in the house, with gold walls and painted millwork. It was finished out in the Louis XV style, with only the finest and most expensive furnishings to spoil her. We can continue up the back staircase towards the third floor where guests would have stayed. 
In the third floor living hall, we can imagine one of the many resident musicians playing songs in the morning to gently wake guests from their slumber. And at night, before turning in for bed, they could have cozied up to the fireplace in an overstuffed chair and read a book under an electric light, something which was almost unheard of at the time. We will skip the fourth floor as it was reserved for staff and wind our way down to the basement. Down here we will find an indoor pool, once again, illuminated with electric lights. And after making our way through stone tunnels, we will find more amenities, such as the gymnasium, boasting the best workout equipment that money could buy in the late 1800s. The Biltmore passed down through his family over the generations, but that is skipping ahead in time. Let's go back to the Gilded Age Manhattan to explore the home of William Kissam Vanderbilt, whose father built the Triple Palace. His residence, known as the Petit Chateau, was a chateau-esque mansion located across the street from the Triple Palace. This architectural gem stood as a testament to the family's continuing aspiration to blend affluence with artistic expression. Constructed between 1878 and 1882, the Petit Chateau was the brainchild of William K. Vanderbilt and his wife Alva, who closely collaborated with architect Richard Morris Hunt to bring her vision to life. This mansion, drawing inspiration from French Renaissance aesthetics, was one of the early adopters of the chateauesque style in New York City, setting a trend for future architectural endeavors. The facade of the Petit Chateau, made from gray Indiana limestone, was a study in asymmetrical beauty, topped with a blue-gray slate roof accented with copper. The exterior, carved by more than 40 artisans from the masonry firm of Ellen and Kitson, was a marvel of late French Gothic style, mingled with Beaux-Arts refinement. It was not just a home, but a statement piece, proclaiming the family's wealth and refined taste. Inside, the grandeur continued, and while it was not properly photographed, we can see the records of the house while we hear the descriptions of each room. The main entrance vestibule opened onto a grand hall of 60 feet in length, faced in Kenstone and adorned with decorative relief. This hall served as the gateway to the mansion's primary rooms, each a masterpiece in its own right. The library, with its 16th century French Renaissance paneling, and the parlor, featuring Gringling Gibbon-style walnut carvings, demonstrated an eclectic yet harmonious blend of historical influences. The piece de resistance was the Louis XIV-style salon, designed by Jules Allard and built in Paris. This room, a significant driver of the trend for French 18th century interiors in New York, boosted a ceiling painted with mythological scenes. The salon not only reflected Alva Vanderbilt's taste, but also her ambition to position the Vanderbilt family as cultural trendsetters. The Petit Chateau, with its grandiose banquet hall, gothic elements, and stained glass windows, was more than a home. It was a canvas where the Vanderbilts displayed their wealth, power, and cultural aspirations. Its role in New York society was cemented by Alva Vanderbilt's famous masquerade ball in 1883, an event that underscored the family's social prominence. However, like many symbols of the Gilded Age, the Petit Chateau's glory was fleeting. Sold in 1926 and demolished a year later, it gave way to the relentless march of modernity, its grandeur living on only in photographs and drawings, though the couple did have one house that survived. Willie Kay wanted to surprise his wife Alva with a birthday present she would never forget, so in 1888, he met with architect Richard Morse Hunt to begin planning a surprise vacation home for her. Quickly, however, Alva became involved in the planning of the house. They purchased a four-acre lot in Newport, Rhode Island to begin construction, and Alva became obsessed with keeping the house a secret so that she could unveil it in a grand party. She had a large fence constructed, blocking the view from the road and hired only Chinese workers who did not speak English. Her reasoning for this was that they would not be able to tell anyone about the project they were working on because not many people spoke Mandarin in Newport at the time. Overall, the house cost a whopping $11 million to build, or the modern-day equivalent of about $343 million, with nearly one-fifth of the budget being devoted solely to marble, hence the name it would receive, Marble House. Four years after construction had started, the 50-room Beaux-Arts-style mansion was finished. Alva threw a huge ball with guests who arrived just after sunset. As carriages approached the house, they found the gate was shut and it was getting too dark out to see. Alva gave her servants a signal and suddenly the entire house was illuminated as the gates swung open. For the first time, the house was now visible to the public. The Beaux-Arts style mansion was clad in marble with solid marble columns and pilasters set in neat intervals below a corresponding balustrade concealing the third floor. Passing between the massive columns, you would enter the home through wrought iron doors, arriving in the grand hall. A giant plaster medallion was set in the ceiling, hovering over the marble floors and walls. From here you could circulate about the interior of the home, with a large gallery connecting the wings from one end and a grand staircase set to the side. The marble stairs floated upwards, wrapped with gilded banisters. Rounded windows punctured the stone walls below an elaborate frieze wrapping towards a celestial mural. At the top, columns surrounded the landing, with tapestries hung on the walls behind them. By 1895, Alva had already divorced William and remarried, but she returned to Marble House to host her daughter's coming out party in the ballroom, 
which sat opposite from the stairs. She had a large fountain constructed in the center of the room and released 300 live hummingbirds to flutter above the heads of her guests. From here we can travel to the dining room in the back of the house. Rose-colored marble was used to decorate the walls, composing the pilasters and window surrounds with gilded capitals upon which rested the frieze. The ceiling plate hosts an elaborate display of craftsmanship surrounding a central mural. To give you an idea of the scale of this room, the dining room table stretched 34 feet long. The New York Times reported, the grand portico was a blaze of lights, and dozens of liveried attendants were on hand to assist and escort the guests from carriage to cloakroom, and finally to the tables with their gold-plated cutlery. Cutting across the gallery back to the entrance hall, we will arrive in the Gothic Library. A large stone fireplace stretched from floor to ceiling with relief work depicting people transforming into spires as the design directed the eye up towards the elaborate ceiling, with twisting coffers carved from stone, appearing nearly organic, soaring above stained glass windows which flooded the room with spotted colors. Upstairs, Alva's bedroom was decorated with busy patterns competing with floral motifs run in the plasterwork and millwork. As time went on, she spent less and less time here because she had moved to Belcourt to be with her new husband. However, she would still use the house primarily as a closet to store her clothes. She was known to wear up to six different outfits per day, and kept staff busy washing her clothes full time in the house. As Alpha grew older, she became more interested in politics, choosing to spearhead the women's suffrage movement. In 1908, she moved back to Marble House and opened it to the public to raise money for her cause. She charged $5 per ticket, or the modern day equivalent of about $160, to view the interior of the home, making sure to keep the price point high enough to not receive commoners. She hosted several fundraising events in the following years, but perhaps none were more spectacular than the Chinese ball she hosted in 1914. She hired Richard Morris Hunt's sons, Richard and Joseph, to design a Chinese tea house at the edge of her property's cliffs. The Hunts drew from 12th century Sung Dynasty era architecture for inspiration to create an amalgamation of Asian architecture, featuring a Shinto gate guarded by stone dogs leading towards a rectangular pagoda with octagonal windows, offering glimpses towards the sea. Though Alva loved her marble house, she chose to live out the rest of her life first in her other mansion, Beacon Towers, and then in France with her daughter Consuelo. As the Great Depression raged on, she sold the house in 1932 for just $1, and all the contents of the home for $99,999, properly avoiding taxes. The Prince family moved in and enjoyed it as a family home, participating in sports such as tennis and polo. When Mr. Prince died, he willed the home to his son Frederick, who opened the home for the first time to the public so that the Preservation Society of Newport County could host the Tiffany Ball, an early preservation fundraiser for protecting Newport's architecture. This event attracted famous figures such as JFK and Gladys Vanderbilt. A few years later, Frederick passed away and Elvis' son Harold Vanderbilt purchased it. He collaborated with the Prince family to donate not only the house, but all of its furnishings to the Preservation Society of Newport County. Since 1964, it has been open to the public for tours. And if you thought Willie Kay's mansions were impressive, just wait until you see his brother's homes. Born into the gilded folds of the Vanderbilt dynasty, Cornelius Vanderbilt II was not just another affluent heir. He was the cherished grandson of the indomitable Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. When he breathed his last, the Commodore bequeathed young Cornelius a staggering $5 million. Barely had the ink dried on the will when Cornelius' father passed away, adding another $70 million to his inheritance, a sum so colossal it would rival a modern fortune of approximately $2.4 billion. With the death of the Commodore, a void gaped at the heart of the Vanderbilt family. Into this chasm lunged Cornelius and his brother Willie Kay, both vying for the now vacant throne of family patriarch. Meanwhile, Manhattan had evolved into the playground of the world's ultra-wealthy. The island was festooned with sumptuous mansions that fringed Central Park, a tableau of opulence where each limestone palace sought to eclipse the one before it. Surrounded by this excessive grandeur, Cornelius felt the weight of competition. His residence, once a beacon of prosperity, now paled in comparison to the lavish estates of his neighbors. Determined to cast an indelible mark on Manhattan's landscape, Cornelius acquired every house on his block and promptly had them raised to the ground. He then commissioned renowned architects Richard Morris Hunt and George B. Post to conjure a dwelling so grandiose it would redefine Manhattan luxury. The result was a sprawling, chateauesque-style mansion boasting six above-ground floors with an astonishing 137 rooms, not even accounting for its expansive basement. This behemoth of beauty and extravagance swallowed the entire block save for a garden that adorned its double height port cocher. However, it was the mansion's interior that laid bare Cornelius' idiosyncratic taste. At its heart sprawled a lavish ballroom, the grandeur of which was meant to leave visitors awestruck. Conspicuously absent was a dedicated art gallery, a common feature in the palaces of the era. For Cornelius, the mansion itself was a work of art, a monument to the Vanderbilt legacy, and a testament to his own soaring ambitions. 
Without further ado, let's enter the mansion below the Port Cochere and begin exploring its lavish interior. Passing through the double doors, we arrive in the terraced entrance hall, where we will begin slowly making our way into the house below the coffered, barrel-vaulted ceiling. Continuing forward, we encounter a spiral kenstone staircase wrapping its way to the top of the house. The columns, balustrade, and ceiling were all carved from the same kenstone with figurative relief work, corbels, ribs, and a plethora of other architectural features. Here, large arches emptied into the bellowing ballroom complete with gilded wall panels and extensive murals. Above its intricately parqueted wood floors, there was standing space for thousands of guests. To one side of the ballroom, the dining room, with its double height cove ceilings, was decorated with paintings by the greats. And nestled between Monet's, above the fireplace, the family was featured in a portrait. Traveling towards the rear of the house, we will find the Moorish smoking room decorated with antique European tapestries set against walls inlaid with exotic old growth wood. We can head back across the ballroom turning to find a corridor with heavily embellished surfaces ornamented by master artisans and stoneworkers. This will lead us towards a set of double art glass doors with gilded ironwork opening into the watercolor room. Here we find a marble arcade feeding into the soaring, barrel-vaulted ceiling, framing portraits and busts of the Vanderbilt family. This connects to Mrs. Vanderbilt's most cherished room, the Grand Salon, finished out in the Louis XV style. Though, for more intimate gatherings, the family could host guests in the adjoining Petit Salon, where the furniture was arranged more conversationally in a smaller but equally grand space. This palatial mansion was only their city home. Their vacation home, known as the Breakers, would rival it in splendor. Cornelius, along with his wife Alice, began searching for the perfect place to build their summer cottage to serve as an escape from their Manhattan mansion. They came across attractive land in Newport, Rhode Island, where a mansion known as the Breakers had just been lost to a devastating fire. In 1885, they purchased a lot for $450,000, or the modern-day equivalent of $14 million, and hired the Vanderbilt family's architect of choice, Richard Morris Hunt, to design for them what would become the largest house in Newport. Construction of the 70-room mansion began in 1893, taking two years to finish. When it was completed, the footprint of the mansion consumed an entire acre of the ground it sat on, boasting 70 rooms spread out across 125,339 square feet. It was designed in the Beaux-Arts style, favoring themes from the Renaissance Revival style with an elaborate cornice situated above coins containing the facade of Indiana limestone blocks. Approaching the house from the street, you would pass through a 30-foot wrought iron gate flanked with limestone, capping off the fence which surrounded the property on all sides, save the ocean front. As you continue up the Pea Gravel Drive, the scale of the house becomes overwhelming with proportions to dwarf the human scale. We will now pass below the Port Cochere, ornamented with stone relief work and forming a groin vault, leading us towards the front door. Entering the home, we arrive in the Great Hall, measuring 50 by 50 feet, with a ceiling height of 50 feet. Marble pilasters framed oversized archways supporting columns above them, towards the ceiling with limestone statues, to depict the greatest in each academic field, such as figures of Galileo and Richard Morris Hunt, to represent the achievements of science and architecture. To one side, the bifurcated staircase sweeps through the central archway with wrought iron balustrade curling along its rise. Imaginative details can be found in every nook and cranny, with the area under the stairs being occupied by a water feature. We can take a quick peek up the stairs before exploring the rest of the house to see the details at the landing. Then we will look up to see a dazzling array of colors refracting through the stained glass skylight overhead. Now let's make our way back into the Great Hall and round the corner to explore the dining room. At 2,400 square feet, the dining room stretches with a 34-seat mahogany table contained by rose alabaster columns below a gilt cornice framing a mural of the Roman goddess Aurora. Though, the family would eat in the Louis XV-style breakfast room towards the front of the house when they were not entertaining. This connected the house to the servant's wing, where we can see a multi-level butler's pantry, with a mezzanine connecting to the kitchen where meals would have been prepared for hundreds of guests at a time on a single, 21-foot-long coal-burning stove. Enough of the behind-the-scenes views, let's journey back into the main house and cut across the dining room towards the back of the house to find the billiards room. Here mahogany furniture contrasts with the marble slab walls. Now we will exit through the side to cut across the loggia towards the morning room, facing east to allow the morning sun to flood the interior, which was constructed in France before being shipped and reassembled on site. We will now skirt by the Great Hall, separated by an arcade, to pass by the oversized hearth which directly faces the Great Stairs, and we will continue forward towards the library, housing a 16th century French fireplace contrasting with walnut panels inlaid with gold leaf below a coffered ceiling. This joins to the music room, where a camp and marble fireplace dominates one wall with a bluish hue below a ceiling inlaid with gold and silver. Both Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt were known to spend a lot of time in the music room, playing the violin and piano together for fun. This room opens towards a terrace framed by topiaries on the side of the house. 
we can follow garden paths, meandering around the house to look back at its detailing on all sides, such as the elaborately arcaded porches adorned in figurative relief work and paired with floral motifs. We can follow grass paths between geometric flower gardens, stepping back to get a better view of the side of the house. Expansive lawns stretched away from the rear of the mansion, the main body of which was symmetrical, with asymmetrical massing, disappearing behind monolithic wings. We can shuffle through the grass, making our way to the terrace to turn around and absorb the ocean views as the tide breaks on the shore of the breakers. In a world ruled by wealth and social stature, Cornelius Vanderbilt II had reclaimed the spotlight, affirming that the Vanderbilt name would not be overshadowed, neither by competitors nor by ostentatious neighbors. And so, his Manhattan mansion and his Newport cottage stood as colossal tributes to a family and a man who would not be eclipsed. Thirteen years after taking residence in his magnificent Manhattan mansion, Cornelius was struck by a debilitating stroke. Upon his death, he left a $7 million trust fund for his wife Alice, ensuring her continued residence at 1 West 57th Street. Alice, stricken with grief, sequestered herself inside the mansion, with her only company being the 37 staff members who lived in the mansion with her. Alice continued to reside there, even as commercial skyscrapers began to crowd the once exclusive Fifth Avenue enclave. She clung tenaciously to her grand estates, yet, in 1926, she yielded to financial realities and sold the Manhattan mansion to a developer who intended to demolish it. In a poignant farewell, she opened the estate to the public a week before demolition, charging a 50-cent admission that she donated to charity. She then salvaged as many architectural elements as she could, allowing anyone to come into the mansion and haul away what they could carry off and save from the wrecking ball. Mrs. Vanderbilt continued to enjoy the breakers until her own passing in 1934, when she willed the house to her daughter Gladys, who leased and eventually sold the breakers to the Preservation Society of Newport, along with most of the mansion's original furnishings. The Vanderbilt family had many opulent and captivating vacation homes all around the country. Frederick William Vanderbilt was born into the third generation of Vanderbilt well. He had as much free time as he did extra money, and was able to pursue his passions, including horticulture. He and his wife Louise Holmes Anthony Torres were visiting with their dear friends at the Mills Mansion when they fell in love with the natural beauty of Dutchess County, New York. Around the same time, an estate known as Hyde Park had been put up for sale by Dorothea Astor's descendants. Hyde Park was a historic estate which had been established in 1705 when Queen Anne granted Pierre Fauconnier 10,000 acres. Over the years, an ever-expanding mansion was built up with manicured gardens surrounding the house and lining the Hudson River. Its various owners over the years all seemed to have a keen sense for horticulture as exotic plants were grown to maturity for centuries at Hyde Park. This diverse landscape of rare and exotic plants coupled with the views of the Hudson River are what compelled Frederick to purchase the now 600-acre estate. In 1895, the Vanderbilts hired the architectural firm of McKim, Mead & White to demolish the 190-year-old mansion and reimagine a palace in its place. At a grand cost of $660,000, or the modern-day equivalent of over $23 million, a 54-room Beaux-Arts-style mansion dominated the views from the garden. Coming in at over 44,000 square feet, the exterior was finished out with Indiana limestone, with porticos protruding from each face of the home. The frieze above the columns was embellished with relief work featuring lion's heads set amongst twisting garland. This theme continued vertically up the linear architectural elements, exaggerating the height of the already colossal mansion. The backside of the house broke with a rectilinear facade to feature a semicircular portico with a radially coffered ceiling inset with limestone flowers. The entrance hall served as an elliptical circulation space from which the other rooms of the main floor were anchored. Set in the center was a large fireplace featuring maidens symbolizing fertility on its lower mantle, which had been salvaged from a European palace. Set in the ceiling was an oculus opening to the second floor. This room was thought of as an informal space, decorated with comfortable furniture where you might find guests napping on the sofas after a long day of socializing. The living room was more formal, with walnut wall panels heavily embellished with carvings surrounding the windows in the marble fireplace. The ceiling was covered with ornamental plasterwork, dividing the room into three distinct bays. The dining room continued with walnut wall panels set below a ceiling which had been salvaged from an Italian palazzo dating back to the 1600s. Two fireplaces in the dining room had been salvaged from buildings a century older, with carvings featuring both the Medici family coat of arms, and the other featuring reliefs depicting the Judgment of Paris. Below the dining room table was the most valuable item in the entire house. Measuring at 20 feet by 40 feet, the 400-year-old Islamic rug is one of the largest of its kind in existence. The grand staircase twisted at its landing, with layers of millwork continuing its forms as it wrapped about the painted wall panels towards the second floor. Arriving at the second floor, you would enter a grand hall mirroring the shape of the entrance hall with balustrades surrounding the oculus, cutting a void to the floor below, illuminated by a skylight mirroring the oculus above. 
The ceiling rounded out with pointed arches vaulting towards each passageway. To one end is the bedroom of Mrs. Vanderbilt, which was modeled after the sleeping chambers of European royals and decorated in a Louis XV style with a distinct railing surrounding her bed. The wall panels were gilded with murals appearing in their upper portions, below a frieze boasting figures almost appearing to dance about the ceiling. Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom was dramatically decorated with rose and gold tones set against a deep green wallpaper. The ceiling fixture radiated with decorative beams reaching towards corbels protruding from the frieze. Each bedroom had its own color-based theme, such as the pink bedroom set with a single bed and all-light furniture. There was also the large red bedroom, providing more space for guests to spread out for extended stays. Similarly, the mauve bedroom contained overstuffed furniture, ensuring guests would feel right at home. On the third floor, there were five additional guest suites as well as servants' quarters. Though the mansion was only occupied for a few months of the year, Frederick kept in close contact with the gardener as he had personally planted over 2,000 rose bushes and laid out Italian-leveled gardens. His passion for gardening continued until the unexpected death of his wife in 1926. He spent the rest of his life grieving her loss, shutting out friends and family. He became a recluse and spent the rest of his life living on the third floor with his servants until his own passing 12 years later. The architectural splendor of the Vanderbilts was not confined to the bustling streets of Manhattan. Across the country, the Vanderbilt family commissioned a series of grand mansions, each a testament to their unparalleled wealth and influence during the Gilded Age. These mansions were not just homes, but also cultural landmarks hosting grand parties and social events that defined an era. They were built in diverse architectural styles, ranging from the refined grandeur of Maggie Vanderbilt's Wood Leah in Westchester, New York, to Florence Adele Vanderbilt's New Jersey mansion dubbed Florham. Each property showcased the family's love for art, luxury, and architectural innovation, often becoming trend centers for their own time. The Vanderbilt mansions across the country were more than mere displays of wealth. They were expressions of an ambition to achieve immortality through stone and mortar. Through these structures, the Vanderbilts cemented their place in American history, not only as industrial magnates, but also as patrons of the arts and architecture. Their legacy, etched in the grand facades and opulent interiors of these homes, continues to fascinate and inspire, serving as a vivid reminder of a bygone era of American history where extravagance knew no bounds. Which mansion was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comment section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.